Welcome, everyone. We are just going to wait just a minute while we get everybody through the waiting room and get started on this great presentation today. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Amanda Arnold. I am the Illinois chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects um, Education Chair. And I'm so pleased to be joining you today to introduce this great panel um, with us and our partnership with APA. Um, so let's, let's dive in. So a couple housekeeping things we wanna start out with. Um, please provide remarks, conversations, and questions in the chat box. Please keep yourself muted otherwise, um, unless we call on you to clarify a question. We, we wanna be able to hear the speakers and enjoy this great discussion. Um, also note that our webinar is being recorded, so you'll have a follow-up email after the event that includes a link to the recording. Um, if you need to have closed captioning, you can click there on Zoom and use English. Um, but feel free to ask questions anytime. We're going to be monitoring the chat box throughout. Um, our other housekeeping item is um, there is certification maintenance for I AICP today. Um, next week, the APA Chicago Metro section will be sending links for your post-survey event and to log in your credentials. Um, ASLA CEUs are also offered today. Um, participants should have received an email. If you haven't, it will come right after the event with a survey to complete for your credit. If you don't see that come across, feel free to email education.ilasla at gmail.com for more information and to receive your certificate. Um, just a little note for APA Illinois chapter membership. This is a great benefit. Um, even if you're not logging credits today, it's great to become a, a, cha a chapter member and join in the benefits of having that connection with other professionals. Um, and it's just $50. So don't hesitate to join and enjoy more of these great events. Um, also, ASLA membership, it's great to reach out for us as well. We just got reinstated with our licensure this year, and so it's a great time to become a member and see all the benefits that you have on the education side as we have continuing ed needs. Um, a couple upcoming events for us, um, APA on November 9th, which is just next week, there's a great Development Incentives 101. Um, and take advantage of those membership rates by becoming a member and joining in that discussion. Um, for the Illinois chapter of ASLA, we're doing our next webinar event December 9th. Um, it's our last webinar of the season and we're gonna dive into plant solutions um, with Jane from Proven Winners. So please feel free to join us for both of those events. So now we're diving into the presentation, oops. Um, so APA and the Illinois chapter of ASLA have had some great discussions over the past several years during our partnerships and partnering with these events. And it's a wonderful partnership. We have great discussions. We formulate great ideas in these events. And it really promotes the great collaboration between planners and landscape architects. And today we're going to put our best feet forward. Um, we're going to talk about climate change. It's the hot topic of the day. Um, it's something that we hear about all the time. It's in the news daily, um, but it's still kind of an unknown for us, and we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we're, well, that's why we're talking today. Um, but despite all this research, there's still a lot of gaps, and the data and the funding mechanisms are not always there. We're still trying to find the solutions, and we're still guessing on what the future is going to hold. But why we're doing that, we're really talking about outside challenges. We hear a lot about um, sea level rising, we hear a lot about the changes in other parts of our world, but we don't always discuss what's happening here in the Midwest and the challenges that we're dealing right here in our backyards, not only in our professions, but in our daily lives because we live here. Um, so we don't really quite know what to go next. So today we're going to be kind of designing, talking about design and talk about codifying what that means for climate change and how we can adapt as professionals and personally how we can adapt and talk about those challenges. So throughout the next 
hour and a half, we're going to have a lot of fun um, hearing from our the former state climatologist, Dr. Jim Angel. He's going to dive into a short 15, 20 minute presentation, um, providing recent updates and research about precipitation and the future of the Midwest. Um, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time really having a discussion with our four expert panelists, um, answering some of these difficult questions that we all have on our minds and trying to have an open discussion about their expertise and their, their best thoughts moving forward. Um, and then we're gonna have a great Q&A from all of you. So without any more ado, I'd like to do a short introduction for Dr. Jim Angel. He is the former state climatologist for Illinois for 20 years. Um, he has a long time association at the Illinois State Water Survey. He was the lead author of the Midwest chapter of the 2018 National Climate Assessment. He has authored several reports and articles on extreme rainfall in Illinois, including the 2020 Update Bulletin 70. Um, he's also the co-author of the 2021 Illinois Climate Assessment, which is just coming out. And he's interested in all aspects of weather and climate in Illinois, not only because he lives here, but because he studied it and he has a great perspective for us today. So without any further ado, Dr. Jim Angel, would you like to share with us what is next for precipitation in Illinois? All right. Thank you, Amanda. Let me share my screen here and uh, let's see here. We'll get uh, the right one going. And there we go. All right. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk <clears throat> about climate change in Illinois, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's kind of scary <clears throat> when I worked in the field so long that uh, you actually see the how the evolution of not only climate change but the discussion about climate change in Illinois has has changed in the last uh, 30 or so years. So we're going to talk today about uh, some issues that are, I think will, hopefully will be of interest to all of you uh, in terms of what to think about in terms of current change and also future changes in Illinois. We talk about climate change. Uh, this is one of my favorite graphs. This is from the National uh, Center for uh, Environmental In Information. And it looks at uh, global temperatures from the 1880s to the present. And what's really eye-catching about this is the steady upward trend in the last 30 years of above average temperatures uh, that we've seen. And it's just consistently. So every year it's a little bit warmer. It just keeps ratcheting up. And the gray line there is the CO2 concentration. So you can see there's a pretty good match there between those two. And so that's kind of uh, not only the correlation, but also cause and effect. We know from physics that the C increase in CO2 levels are, are you know, heating up the atmosphere, trap in the heat. Uh, and as, as we increase those levels, the temperatures increase as well. So if proven this in, in lab experiments and in, in climate models and so forth. And so this is pretty much a done deal. When I first started 30 so years ago, this was all kind of more, it was pretty much on the cutting edge of what we thought might happen. But now the scientists are very certain that that, that the increase in, in car, uh, carbon dioxide is, has been driving these increases. Now, in addition to kind of these global uh, effects, we also have kind of the more localized ones, and these include the uh, urban environment in particular compared to their rural uh, neighbors. And then we know from a long, long time ago that uh, the cities are much warmer than the countryside. I have a book from, I think it's from 1913 about the, called The Climate of Chicago, and they talk about the urban heat island in that book. So it's a well-known phenomenon where the, you get the, the built up downtown areas in particular, where it's all buildings, parking lots and so forth. Uh, they not only heat up more in the daytime, but they retain that heat more in the winter, in the nighttime temperatures. And so overall, it, it leads to a much warmer environment and very problematic uh, during heat waves. Uh, in addition to that, with all those paved surfaces, impervious surfaces, you get increased flash flooding in urban areas. And so that's an additional problem that we have uh, that you don't see in the rural areas. So the big contrast there between urban and rural and as Chicago goes from the, the, the soggy uh, uh, fields of, of 200 years ago <laughs> into this very sprawling part of uh, the Northeastern Illinois, you can see these changes in things like stream flows 
and, and uh, temperatures at uh, places around the, the northeast there. So in the, in the uh, Illinois climate assessment, we looked at historical trends and we also looked at projections. And so we'll talk a little bit about the historical trends and observed temperatures. And I, a couple of things to point out in this is that one of the things that we've noticed is in, in terms of the temperature trends is a lot of times it's the nighttime temperatures have seen the strongest increases over time and it's the strongest in the wintertime. So, as you, if you've been around Chicago for a number of years, especially if you've been around since the 1970s, you know that that our winters have been getting milder. We have occasional cold winters or occasional cold spots in winters, but overall, our winter has been trending to, towards milder conditions, and we see this in the data. Uh, the other months, it's it's increasing as well, maybe not quite as noticeable or dramatic. One exception is the daytime high temperatures in summer. Those have actually kind of plateaued, or in fact, they're even a little bit down. The hottest daytime temperatures we've seen in Chicago were in the 1930s. And we had large scale droughts and big heat waves across the state. Um, so we haven't seen that as much recently. And, I and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But one of the things that we think is going on is that we've also been trending wetter and you get a lot of rain and, and uh, cloudiness and so forth, that kind of holds down the daytime temperatures in the summertime. So we're seeing this real lack in the, the summertime heating so far, and that may not uh, hold true as we move on into the future, but at least historically, it's really the 1930s that are the standout decade there. But overall, we've been seeing warming across the region not as strong as what we'd see out west or to the, our north. We talk to people in Wisconsin or, or out in California, places like that, uh, the warming out there has been more pronounced than it is here. This is a, <clears throat> a graph that uh, National Weather Service in Chicago showed just a couple of days ago. I thought it was very interesting. What they did is they took the, the number of top 10 warmest records by decade, and they just threw everything in there. So hottest month, hottest season, hottest years, and threw it all in the hopper there and sum those up by, uh, by decade here. And you can see that you know each decade, you, you, obviously you're gonna always get some of these, these record uh, heat events. But if you look at the last 10 years, it's really head and shoulders above all the other decades in terms of the number of hot months. And October was the hot, one of the hot months. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, but also, we're just seeing more of these really warm events fall into place in the last decade or two. So uh, right now, we're in some pretty historical changes in, in the temperatures in Illinois. <clears throat> in terms of precipitation, this is the area that I spent a lot of time in doing research is increased uh, precipitation across uh, uh, the region. And really, it's pretty much across the board. Most places are seeing about 10 to 15% increase in, in overall precipitation, and it's spread out in all four seasons. So we're just in a much wetter climate now than we were, say, uh, 50 to 100 years ago. So it's a very pronounced difference in that, and that has ramifications for flooding and, and uh, other things. But uh, that has been probably the most pronounced and persistent uh, climate change that we've seen in Illinois that's had the biggest impacts in terms of dollars. So uh, in urban areas, you get flooding uh, that can be disruptive for transportation. You get basements flooded and so forth. Uh, and then uh, obviously with Illinois, with agriculture, that's a big impact there too with flooded fields and delayed plantings and things like that. So that's probably one of the, the, the biggest and strongest indicators of climate change that we've dealt with in Illinois in the last 30 years is this trend towards overall wetter conditions. Uh, so I guess that maybe there's an upside to this is that we're seeing fewer droughts. This is uh, called the Palmer Drought Index. It's just one measure of drought uh, that we use that we got the records back to 1895. And the areas in red are in are some degree of dryness, the areas in blue are in some degree of, of wetness. And I've got the major droughts labeled there. So 1901 to 1902, uh, all the way up to the present. And really from about 1900 to about 1965, they had a lot of pretty strong, severe droughts in Illinois. Uh, it's a real doozy, it's a couple of, and we're even multi-year droughts. 
Uh, since the 1960s, though, it's become much less common. We've had droughts in 88 and, and 2012. Uh, and then, then this year, which isn't on this graph, uh, these are statewide numbers. So the, one, the drought in, in Northern Illinois this year probably wouldn't show up much in this. But uh, the point is that we've gone away from these really long-term severe droughts and we're more into these more short-term intense droughts that we see that maybe only last one summer. Uh, so that's a big change in the drought climatology and maybe the, the upside so of heavier, more precipitation as you get more flooding, but you also get uh, fewer of these long-term droughts. Snowfall, another one that that's, um, really doesn't have much of a, a trend at all. We've had, you can see the standout uh, winters uh, in the 1970s there. We had a lot of snow statewide. Uh, but if you look at uh, earlier records, it was we, we're not a, a particularly snowy state to begin with. I mean, if you talk to people in Michigan, <laughs> in the upper peninsula of Michigan, they laugh at the snowfall totals that we have here uh, in Illinois. But it really, there has not, not been a, a long-term trend in that. So I'll talk a little bit about projections into the future. And we use scenarios of what the future might look like. And these are just scenarios. They're not a particular forecast. Uh, they're just an, an, give us an idea, kind of upper lower bounds of what the response might be to climate change. And so we, the two that we used here in, in the report for Illinois and also in the, the national assessment was a higher scenario, which is sometimes called the business as usual. So we just keep doing what we're doing now and putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And that leads to uh, strong warming, uh, not only in Illinois, but also across the globe. Uh, so that puts us at about a four degrees C or almost eight degrees uh, warming by the end of the century. Uh, and then we use a, a lower scenario, which is where we, we start to kind of taper off our, our fossil fuel usage in the next couple of years and it drops down to not to zero, but uh, much lower levels than what we've done in the past. And that can bend the curve. That can cause our temperatures to be much less extreme than they are uh, with, compared to the higher scenario there. So we'll show you some high low uh, scenarios moving forward here so you can kind of see what's, what's going on there. <clears throat> and in the report, we have uh, a whole host of these. So it's kind of a subset of, What's of the maps that are in the report, but the general pattern is in the top row, we have the lower emission scenarios for mid to late century. The bottom, bottom panel is the higher emission scenarios for mid to late century. And the overall message in this is that you get the strongest response at the end of the century with the high emission scenario. You get the lowest response for, to the climate in the low emission scenario by mid-century, but it still it can be significant. So for us in Illinois, it's about a three or four degree warming by mid-century under the low scenario with about four to five degrees by late century, but it really warms up uh, in the high scenario. By end of century, we're looking at eight to nine degrees warming compared to the modern day uh, averages right there. So it's significantly higher warming rate than what we what we're used to and, and well beyond what we would experience even like in the 1930s so it's it's much warmer climate than, than what we're used to dealing with so overall warming is projected into the future uh, the only uncertainty is just <clears throat> depending on how much our scenario how much our emissions are going to be into the future we look at projected uh, precipitation. This is a little more muted going into the future. So we are expected to see increases, but they're much milder than the, the kind of responses we saw in temperature. Uh, so it's about uh, well, between uh, zero to 4% wetter by mid-century and two to 6% wetter by late century in the low emission scenarios. And probably the strongest, once again, is late century high emission scenario of about four to 10%, depending on where you are. In fact, Northern Illinois is, is um, um, leaning towards the 10% uh, values there. So we've seen this trend towards warmer and wetter conditions in the historical records, and it's projected that those will continue on into the future. 
And just, you know, sometimes you, you say, you know, four to five degree warming, you think, well, that's, that doesn't sound like much, but just kind of get, put that in perspective. So we just came off uh, uh, the ninth warmest uh, uh, October on record in Chicago, and it was about 5.7 degrees above war uh, average, and also much wetter than, than average too. So about 2.3 inches wetter than average. So the point here is that, you know, you talk about a couple of degrees, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but actually that's a pretty big deal. I mean, this October was weirdly, uh, unnaturally warm. Uh, I remember being out in, in short sleeve shirts at the beginning of the month where normally I'm wearing flannel shirts. So that was kind of disappointing to still be wearing cool or warm weather clothes. But the other thing too, is that when we talk about global warming and climate change, it's not just summertime temperatures that'll change. It's temperatures throughout the year, including the fall and spring. So these uh, are gonna be uh, big changes for us in terms of the climate of Illinois. So increased heavy precipitation. Interesting enough, while the average precipitation is expected to mildly increase into the future, it's the heavy precipitation events that are going to be uh, much more of a problem moving on into the future. So on the left panel here, we got bar plots of uh, the number of two inch rain events uh, across the state and they've been marching steadily upward by every, this, these are five-year averages here. Uh, but whereas they used to get maybe one or two per station every half, half decade, uh, now we're getting closer to two and a half in the last uh, period here. So these two-inch rain events are kind of a threshold of where you start to see flooding issues uh, in, in the urban area and, and even in rural areas too. So that's kind of the threshold where they start to be a problem. And we see the same trends in the four and six and eight inch rain events as well, just much more common uh, than we used to see. And also the other thing too, is we're seeing a lot more of these in the off, what I call the off season. So not just summer where we have a lot of convective activity, a lot of thunderstorms. They also see them even in the winter months. So we've been seeing a lot of December, January, February, large scale flooding events across Illinois uh, that are they're pretty dramatic. Uh, that's something that we used to not see in the past. And the projections are they're expected to continue. So the number of days with two inches or more expected to increase. In the low emission scenarios, it's uh, you know on the order of about uh, uh, percentage wise about thirty to sixty percent, and the, the high scenario it's more like sixty to one hundred twenty percent. So we could easily double those by the end of the century under the high emission scenario. So. This is something that we see in Illinois, we see across the US and across the globe. It's just as you warm up the atmosphere, you're revving up the hydrologic cycle. So you get more evaporation into the atmosphere that's more moisture that storms can tap into. And so that's just fueling these, these heavy rain events. Days over 100 degrees, this is one of my personal thresholds and when it's really hot out. Uh, and this is another one with that, um, we see that now uh, 100 degree weather is pretty rare in Illinois, especially in the northern part of the state. In Southern Illinois, we might see it about once a year, but in Northern Illinois, it's extremely rare. And by the end of the century, or by mid to late century, even under the low emission scenarios, we could see you know, six to, to 18 days uh, occurring. And then by the higher scenario, it's actually be six to 48 days. So we could have long stretches of really hot weather and that's uh, going to be a, a big challenge moving forward is not just the overall increase in, in temperatures, but the much higher risk of, of uh, these extremely hot days, these heat waves that are going to occur. So I would think that that would be something to consider in terms of planning for and, and building into the future. Uh, also, the growing season length uh, will be longer. So uh, as far as uh, planting goes, we, you know, that may be kind of good news, bad news, is longer growing season, although it could be challenging with the much hotter conditions. Uh, and then our hardiness zones may change as we move on into the future. And probably what we're going to see, we talked to the, the ecologist, is that we'll probably see a migration of, of the warmer species northward. So we'll probably get more of the so-called invasive species moving in. And some of the cold uh, season, uh, cold weather species may actually move out or lose ground 
uh, or lose advantage to these uh, warmer season varieties. So the climate of, of Illinois by mid to late century uh, may change our total environment moving forward. So it may be, uh, and, you know, one of the things that I that strikes me is I started to see armadillos in Southern Illinois. Uh, in fact, they're quite common in Southern Illinois and they're starting to creep into Central Illinois now. So, you know, it could be that by late century, it could be the, the Chicago armadillos into the Chicago bears if we continue on this path. Uh, so impacts on water resources. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the flooding impacts uh, water quality as well as uh, the, the physical impacts that impacts the water quality in urban areas with significant economic costs and environmental damage and public health hazards as well. So we know that all these flooding of basements and so forth at the individual level is very catastrophic, very stressful uh, for homeowners to, you know, they now lose everything in the basement, then they got mold and mildew problems. And sometimes it's not just water in the basement, it's sewage as well. So it's just a real personal disaster at the local level. And I will say that a lot of the areas that are hardest hit are the older neighborhoods and also the lower income neighborhoods are especially vulnerable uh, to these kinds of situations. So that's expected to be a continued problem moving on into the future with the heavier precipitation events. Also, the, the impacts on public health, as I hinted at earlier with the flooding, that's a specific case, uh, but also the higher uh, temperatures, uh, more heat-related injuries and deaths, also higher number of days with high ozone concentrations, and all of these are expected to continue on into the future, especially with late century, especially with the higher emission scenarios. So that's another challenge as we move forward. Also, just kind of touch on this uh, rainfall frequency atlas for Illinois this is kind of the time sequence of what's happened in, in Illinois. So I worked on the original bullet in 70 in 1989. And then uh, we just updated the, uh, the bullet in 70 to bullet in 75 now in, in 2020. And so those are the most recent numbers. And what we basically did is we looked at uh, especially the data after World War II. So we tried to concentrate in the more recent period, which was wetter. And then we gave additional weight to the, the, the last uh, 30 years of the record. So we really focused on trying to get a handle on what the current risk is for uh, climate change in terms of the impacts on, on these heavy rain events. So just to give you uh, one example here, here's the 24 hour, 100 year storm. The old bulletin 70 of 7.58 inches. In the new study, it's 8.57 inches. So we've gained an inch just in the last uh, 30 years of, of data collection there. Uh, so a significant increase because that extra inch, all of that's going in, into runoff at this stage. So we're seeing big changes in the heavy precipitation events. In fact, if you look at old TP40, it's the 100 year storm was something like uh, 4.8 inches. So it's this is significantly heavier. And one of the things we're, we've also worked on in some other studies is looking at projections of how uh, th this may play out in the future. So we've seen in, in some studies we've done to the Chicago area a couple of years ago uh, that we could see increases of a 10 to 20% increase in the 100 year storm by mid to late century, kind of depending on the scenario again. Uh, but we can see some pretty strong changes in how this is going to play out into the future. So just in summary, human-induced climate change is happening in Illinois. We've got the observations. We know that we're getting warmer with more precipitation and more heavy, pre in particular, heavy rains. And the projections by mid to late century, by even mid-century, which is our lifetime of planning, uh, these trends towards warmer and wetter conditions are expected to continue with the increased challenges of severe heat waves and flooding issues. And it's also important to note that uh, these uh, uh, scenarios, it really makes a difference about whether we take the high path or the low path in terms of the severity of these impacts. So uh, it's certainly worth that conversation of, of knowing that we, we can do something about this. So with that, I will uh, stop and turn it back over. And here's the link. And what we'll do is uh, we'll talk, 
figure out how we can do this is I'll make these slides available so that you can actually look at them yourself. Of course, we have the recording as well, but here's the, the assessment for climate change in Illinois that we just finished up this year. Uh, it's done in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy and about uh, 40 authors from Northwestern University, University of Illinois, and some other agencies as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Actually turning it over to me, and I want to say oh, thanks, okay. yeah, good. thanks so much, Jim. Sure. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your years of experience with us. Uh, if you don't know Jim, he's certainly one of our state's treasures, and we just we really appreciate you. Let me share my screen now. So Jim talked about a uh, trend towards overall wetter and warmer conditions. And the point of our panel today is just to talk about what can we uh, as landscape architects, planners and others do about it? What can we do with this information that he just shared? So we've got uh, a real all-star panel of folks assembled. You can see their title and affiliation on the screen, but I'm gonna read the, the brief bios here. So first, uh, Dave Frigo uh, has degrees in landscape architecture and ornamental horticulture and is a leader in education studio at the Hitchcock Design Group. Julia Nordyke is an outreach specialist with the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute, where she works with coastal communities on a variety of sustainability and water quality topics. Chad Rigsby has a PhD in environmental sciences and is a research scientist and technical support specialist with the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories based at the Morton Arboretum. And I'm Justin Keller. I'm a manager of water resources at the Metropolitan Planning Council. And for this event, I'm also the, the treasurer of the APA Chicago Metro section. Uh, so we're gonna pull in our, our all-star panelists, really excited for this discussion that we're gonna have today. And we wanna start it off with kind of a general level setting. Uh, so the first question is gonna go to Julia. Uh, I think that we need to just make sure everybody's on the same page here. So when we talk about green stormwater infrastructure first, what do those solutions entail and what are some of the benefits? Hey, thanks, Justin. And uh, welcome to everybody, on to our panelists and um, our participants, really happy to be here. Um, so to, thinking a little bit more about what green, what we say when we mean green, green infrastructure, and I'm gonna be pretty, I'm gonna say though that I don't just view this and I don't think we should view this as just green stormwater infrastructure. I think it's more um, that we really need to be more encompassing and it's more of an umbrella term. Um, generally, you know, the definition is mimicking hydrological processes uh, using plants and soils uh, that infiltrate store water for evaporation. Uh, but, um, you know, we do, this does include generally, you know, our rain barrels, cisterns, bioswales, bioretention, rain gardens, and permeable pavements. But this definition really does also and should include uh, riparian areas and floodplains wetlands, forests, and even in our built environment, things that we might not think of as stormwater infrastructure, like our parks, um, yeah, our parks, and even um, our community gardens, and our urban tree canopy. Uh, so some of those are really the ones. And let me tell you why a little bit why we shouldn't really put it in just the stormwater bucket. It's, it's kind of too narrow of a scope. Uh, and then it automatically puts it into like an engineering department or, or just the engineer's pocket. And we really know that green infrastructure, uh, when we're going to go to a community to work on this, it really needs to be thought of uh, from more perspectives, specifically the community. So planners and parks people, uh, and then also our community. Um, so green infrastructure really is, in my view, a climate justice tool. Um, it's really what we're talking about when we're thinking about the future and transitioning our neighborhoods is reinvestments like investing in these underserved and historically marginalized areas that have not had those major infrastructure investments in the past. Um, of course, there are the stormwater benefits. We have, you know, they can, it can definitely help with nuisance flooding if it's strategically placed. It takes stress off the gray infrastructure system, which is, uh, should be, um, is definitely a, a benefit that we don't talk about as enough. Um, and then it has these water quality benefits that a lot of us have been working on for decades. <laughs> um, but there's also the urban greening and how that relates to public health, specifically in the face of climate and climate change. Uh, so thinking about urban 
heat island effect and how greening our cities can help that. Um, there's a study that recently came out that, you know, trees, tree canopy can actually reduce uh, in, munis in cities like 10 degrees in, in uh, differences between neighborhoods with tree canopy. Um, and then also the mental health about being closer to nature and being in, in, in green areas and then definitely public safety, green infrastructure if put in the built environment can be public safety. And then of course, uh, since there's a lot of landscape architects on the call here today, you know, a huge benefit for potential for aesthetics and placemaking um, and those kind of benefits too. So not just stormwater, but a lot of co benefits come along with it. Yeah, so I really view that it as an umbrella term that it's, it's green infrastructure is really a tool that we can really help meet the community's objectives and goals, whatever they whatever they may be, whether it's even just a site or a neighborhood or a business district or even a watershed, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've heard uh, in discussion that they should be called coal benefits as opposed to additional benefits because those are all part of why we do the green infrastructure. So thanks, thanks for that level setting. I'm gonna pull Dave in now. Uh, so kind of building on that, what are some of the, the shifts in design elements that can provide greater resilience? Um, I mean, it's, it's a lot of stuff we already know, but we often don't get to do. So just right sizing the amount of hardscape we put on our projects. If you talk to clients, they're like, we need more parking, we need more hardscape, but, but right sizing those really, really goes a long way. I'd say the other part of that is really making sure that we provide um, just really well done areas for, that we expect our plants to, to grow in. Um, so often, especially in ur urban areas, you know, a street tree gets a four by four, you know, hole, hole in the sidewalk and is, is expected to uh, grow and mature and it just dies a slow seven year death. So really looking at our soil profiles, really looking at creating better conditions so that the plants we do plant, the trees, the shrubs, the natives can all really do their part. But if they never get to grow and mature and be what they can, we need to do that. So looking at soil, um, looking at a more diverse plant palette because that will help as, as temperatures change, as moisture changes. We need to know who the winners and losers are. And if we're planting the same, you know, 10 shrubs and, and 10 trees, we're not going to see what new plants might be more beneficial. Um, other things are, are just less salt in the environment, again, so that we can create better environment for our plants to grow. You just yeah, you know, if you're already stressing them out and then you basically brine them all winter long, um, you know, the good news is, is if we have less snow events, perhaps there'll be less use of salt, but we're not seeing that just yet. Um, and then lastly, if we do have pavements, you know, think, think about, um, you know, trying to keep the, the stormwater on your site as long as possible. So whether that's permeable pavement, whether it's storing on, you know, green roofs are now becoming blue roofs and they have a, a stormwater capacity there. So, you know, it, it's all of these things that I think we're, we're going to need to do in order to really boost our, our landscape re resilience. So if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, hardscape is not the enemy, though so that seven year slow death is, uh, that makes me sad. Uh, yeah. But it's really designing those landscapes properly so that the plants can do their thing and then behavioral changes like the sensible salting. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that. And Chad, still on the idea of level setting for, for our audience. Uh, I guess first, what is arboriculture uh, and then how can urban forestry help with climate resilience? So Julia, and uh, and uh, and Dave uh, basically did my job for me. Those were, those were excellent uh, points that 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 both you guys brought up. Um, this is going to be an easy sell, I think. Uh, Arbor culture uh, is is the care and maintenance of individual trees, and that sets it apart from things like forestry where you're managing big tracts of land. In, in arboriculture, urban forestry, we're, we're focused on, on the individual trees. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you, you're, you're not managing large tracts of, of land uh, with many trees in them like a, like a city forester would. Uh, these are <laughs> involving things like pruning, soil care, uh, pest management, 
removal and, uh, and risk management. Um, again, all revolving around individual trees uh, and, and usually working in, in an urban environment in our cities and suburbs. Um, the, I will say the perception out there um, that planting more trees in our ur urban environments uh, will help sequester carbon and, and slow climate change. This idea is unfortunately not the case. It doesn't appear to be. Um, all the research that I'm aware of uh, that's been done thus far suggests that uh, the urban environment is such a harsh, uh, as kind of Julia was alluding to, such a harsh environment that um, you have to input just as much carbon into maintaining a healthy tree as you get from sequestration benefits. So that's not really the, where the benefits of our urban trees are. Uh, if we're talking about carbon sequestration and trees, uh, there are really two things to do and to target when it comes to that. It's, it's protecting existing forests and it's reforestation. So it's really not our urban trees that we're, that we're focused on. Um, but urban trees, uh, when properly maintained, can have a lot of really good benefits. Uh, and, and there were several mentioned um, trapping particulates and contaminants uh, with regards to human health, uh, greatly reducing stress and anxiety and increasing mental health. Uh, there are uh, several studies um, that have made connections between positive health outcomes and uh, the availability of green spaces and trees. Uh, one uh, found that, <laughs> excuse me, the uh, post-operative uh, hospital stays are drastically shortened when patients are in recovering in rooms where they have views of, of green spaces and trees. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, quantifiable uh, positive impacts on human health. Uh, the, was mentioned the water and soil management when we were talking about you know storm runoff and, and, and soil erosion and all those things and contaminants ending up in rivers and sediments ending up in rivers, a lot of positive benefits there. Also energy from an energy perspective, uh, strategically placed trees. So for example, a strategically placed deciduous tree uh, can reduce the cost of air conditioning uh, in some cases by up to 30% in the summertime. And uh, likewise in the wintertime, strategically placed evergreens uh, serving as windbreaks, for example, uh, can save heating costs by as much as 50% in, in the winter. Uh, and then obviously battling the, the heat island effect, um, you know, reducing temperatures there that was, that was previously said. Uh, and the last point that I'll make is, um, it's important to point out that um, all these benefits that trees provide come with risk. Every time you walk under a tree, there is a level of risk to your, your person, to other people, to property. And the role of the arborist in the urban forester is to care for uh, trees in a way that maximizes the benefits that we're all aware of and, and were mentioned, and minimizing risk. We can't have trees uh, damaging property and and uh, and far worse than that. Chad, that uh, response was something of a roller coaster. Uh, I was <laughs> feeling down at the beginning because you were talking how trees are not just the instant panacea for uh, carbon sequestration, but they can be an important element in a, a suite of activities, which maybe includes other things that lower our, our, our carbon emission outputs. Uh, but then the danger involved in trees. Okay, uh, a lot of things to consider. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Moving on from just a general level setting, uh, we heard uh, from Jim about the really stronger storms that we've already been seeing uh, and are now ready to respond to. Uh, so I think for, for Dave, I want to know what has the response been among the design community? Uh, we've been hearing a lot about these climate impacts. Did everyone immediately respond with more resilient designs or, or has the adaptation been a bit more gradual? 
You know, I, I think it's, it's gradual because we haven't seen kind of a tipping point. You know, it, when, when the Emerald Ash Borer came around, we, we had an immediate threat and we had an immediate action. But because this, you know, this one is kind of sneaking up on everyone, people don't feel like it's all hands on, on deck yet. You know, that said, um, people, you're always going to be um, clients and designers who are in the forefront who see it coming and are trying to get out in front of it. Um, I'm seeing that more happening on maybe an institutional level because they're kind of the owner occupied clients who are who know whatever they do now they're going to have to um, deal with for the next 75 or 100 years if it's a, a college campus or a, a park and rec department or, or something like that. So so they're a little more open to doing some of these things. Um, the private side, um, you know, they're more about now. What's what what costs do I have to occur now? Um, and, and it's hard to blame them. They make their living on the margin. So spending extra dollars now for things that may not really pay back, um, it's not it's it's not in their in their forefront. You know where where things kind of lap over are, are things like lead and sites that are now setting some frameworks that everyone can kind of latch onto that have you know, a bit of marketing cachet. But I think for stormwater now, we're still looking at stormwater ordinances and they really guide what the design professions do, whether it's and you know, civil engineers, landscape art architects, that's really telling that that's really the standard now. I mean, the the good news is that you know here in the Chicagoland area, they just reevaluated their storm numbers. They've just upped um, their requirements, you know. But again, that's it's it's reactionary. No one's no one's doing it in advance of what will be even higher storm events and even higher rain rainfall amounts. Yeah, and, and I think that's in large part to, to Dr. Angel uh, doing those updated storm mm -hmm. storm figures. So thanks again yeah. to, to him. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about ordinance and, and codifying change in a bit. Uh, before that, I want to pitch the same question to, to Chad. Uh, the same idea of what has been the response uh, in the research community and, and are we doing enough for how to, to mitigate against climate change? Yeah, I, I would actually uh, completely echo uh, Dave on that. I've I've personally, uh, just just like Dave said, I uh, Emerald Ash Borer was a great example because there it's it's a threat. We understand it. We see it. Uh, we see all these ash trees dying uh, around us. We have to do something. This is quite different. Um, uh, so I, I've not seen, you know, enough movement uh, out there uh, from the community. I have seen movement, uh, and I, I get a lot of questions from designers about um, about these issues. Uh, so the the interest seems to be increasing um, in in solutions and and trying to design sustainable um, uh, landscapes. But these questions, I think, are centered more um, more on the you know specifics of what do I replace this species with? Um, I used to use, uh, for example, blue spruce in all of my designs, and I obviously can't do that anymore. Uh, what do I replace ash with? What uh, what boxwood? Uh, cultivars are resistant to boxwood blight or, or things like that. I've not seen enough people saying, you know, wait a minute, time out. Uh, how do we rethink, rethink this in the, in the context of climate change? Um, I don't want to just, just pound on the, the, the design community though. Um, uh, we, ha as a, as a, arboriculture community have been slow to adapt as well. Um, but I would also argue at the same time that it's it there's a fair amount of blame to go around. Um, the, the green industry generally, I, I really feel uh, suffers from almost this crippling level of neglect from the research community as a whole. 
Um, you, you know, you used to visit state universities that had entire uh, entomology departments dedicated to horticulture, pests, and fruit tree management, and and all these things. Uh, you don't see that anymore, and that's not where the the funding is. Uh, so a little bit of this research takes place. There are still some holdouts in in academia. Uh, at we're a private company, Bartlett Tree uh, Experts, and we have our laboratory, Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories, that that has kind of picked up uh, uh, a fairly heavy lift of this mantle and, and, and we're taking that. Um, but a lot of these questions such as, you know, uh, in the light of climate change, what, spe what, what species should folks be planting? Is it, is it as, as simple as looking at a plant hardiness zone south of us, one, one zone or, or, or so south of us, grabbing those plants and pulling them up here? Is it, is it that simple? I, I don't know. We still have, um, I, I would say last winter in the Chicagoland area, we had a, a, a solid zone five winter for the first time in a few years. We're, other than that, we're pretty squarely zone six. Um, so it's a problem, um, and, and I really, really feel like we need some investment uh, from, from a research perspective to start uh, pushing these ideas and start making these adaptations as a green industry community. Yeah, yeah I think Dave and Chad, you're both talking about uh, the reactive nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't use this tree anymore. So what should I use? Uh, well, got yeah. These new... yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and, and what's interesting is because we're in this transition zone, you know, the, the, the place where I do that kind of experimenting is, is in my backyard because I'm spending my own money to see what does well. And I have, you know, you know, as Chad said, I have those plants that, you know, if the plants read the books, they wouldn't be living in my yard, but they are because number one, I have great soil. I'm, you know, uh, and I've taken some chances and micro found the microclimates, but we've also had, you know, I, I had minus 30 degrees in my yard a few years ago when we had one of those vortexes and things that were clearly hardy in my yard died down to snow level or died completely. So we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with heat, but we're also dealing with those weird, wacky winter cold snaps. And that's a lot to ask a plant to, do and and so if we are going to start to experiment we're going to have to help those plants along because everything they need isn't here just yet it'll be here in the future but they're not here right now so you might need to 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 water plants more or get them better established or give them better conditions to grow in in hopes that 15 20 years from now when you know things are are wetter and and warmer that they're you know that that they're established yeah, I, I think that all this plant talk has been great, but getting beyond my area of technical expertise mm -hmm. uh, as an urban planner, I want to direct us to, to a more comfortable area of codes and ordinances. Uh, <laughs> so I've got a, a question for you, Julia. Uh, in, in the Chicago region, at least, I know you're up in Wisconsin, but probably similar there, the bulk of our stormwater infrastructure, both green and gray, uh, is built to meet detention and volume control requirements. So developers are, are meeting the requirements that they have. They have to. Uh, but from your work, how can ordinances help communities get even more stormwater infrastructure? And then when trying to develop those code, codes and ordinances, what are some of the challenges that we might encounter? Um, yeah, great question, Justin. Um, so I think, again, I'm going to broaden it out from just the stormwater perspective. Um, so codes and ordinances in general for many, all the communities as uh, many people might be aware of on the if you're your planners and landscape architects so um you know really impact a lot of community life in many ways and it does they do set the standards for like road widths and cul-de-sacs um uh how land use is developed and uh and and even redevelopment and so you know and then they also set forth like the structure and governance for many of the processes through our communities too. So um, across the nation, uh, our codes are extremely outdated just in general. Um, you know, we have examples of uh, having, uh, you know, 
different parking ratios for men's and women's department stores still have been found. I think that kind of goes to, I think, Dave's point, you know, proper sizing. Uh, what are the appropriate parking ratios we should be looking at and impervious surfaces in general? Um, so that's just like one example. Uh, how they're outdated and they don't really they were developed during a time when we didn't really understand the complexity of how water moves through our through our municipalities. Um, and then on top of that, you know, all municipalities are different. All the codes are very complex um, and you can find barriers to green infrastructure and stormwater infrastructure in many other parts, not just the stormwater ordinance, for example. So it's it's great that Chicago's, you know, updating theirs to take into larger storm events, uh, but for example, you could have conflicting things that impact green and green infrastructure is relatively new technology um, and it's changing a lot. Um, and so you could have like a part of the code that allows for permeable materials, uh, but then in another part of the code like requires seal coating of everything. So um, there's a lot of nuance to codes and ordinances in general. Um, and so they that's where there's a lot of barriers just in general. So you're looking not just at the stormwater stuff. Um, so some of the biggest challenge, so what you want to kind of do is look at those, look at your codes and ordinances and try to figure out where there's barriers to green infrastructure and where you're doing well and where you're not for certain things. Um, and, and so some of the challenge, and then I don't know if this is appropriate, you want me to mention the audit, the workbook, maybe. So this, where I'm coming from, oh, let's see if this is, oh. That's not coming in very I'll, well. I'll drop the link in the chat, chat and people can go to the resource. Thank you. We developed a local code and ordinance audit, uh, basically for municipalities that covers a, a very comprehensively, you know, many different topics like zoning. For this group, you know, one of the biggest places there's been found barriers are in landscape standards. You know, you have basically the landscaper comes in, puts in some trees in a parking lot, people spend money on it. Stormwater management's thought of at the very last second and like squeezed into the whole process. Um, and, and then, you know, 10 years later, you have a dead tree sticking out of a parking lot. Um, so we need to be like thinking a lot smar smarter about how water is received on a site and how it, those two things can be come together. So that's just one example. So we cover a lot of things in that audit, that audit workbook. Um, and some of the challenge, and one of the benefits of the work or some of the challenges would to your point um i think when working with codes and ordinances i think one of the biggest ones you know they're pretty typical it takes time sometimes doing these work audits and changes take like years <laughs> and then and it goes through many many departments you also have local politics and 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 just like changeover um so one of the things to kind of contradict that is uh, you know, to build this process up over time and work with your municipality and really identify the goals um, and see how green infrastructure fits into your community and the community, how it can meet the community goals. Uh, so if you, you know, you don't have certain things that maybe you really don't want to use permeable materials for some reason, then, you know, focus on something else. Um, uh, and then just really generally like the fear of change um, and uh, and communities even getting demonstration projects off the ground. That is probably one of the, the biggest challenges and barriers. Um, but codes and ordinances, on the other hand, I'll just end that they offer an amazing opportunity for communities that maybe haven't even started it and they it helps start the conversation. Um, there's a lot of, you know, your, 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 your city councils, the village councils, whatnot, or boards, they, um, they, that's what they can affect. They can affect policy changes uh, and, and they really like to learn. And, and green infrastructure really takes all different perspectives. It's again, just not an engineering issue. You have to have planning at the table to talk about like how these things work in the community and where decisions are being made. Um, and so going through an audit can really help a community start the conversation and identify like where are we gonna focus our green infrastructure. Uh, efforts on. So for example, one of the communities I've been working with lately who did not it, it was it has been landscaping standards, but also updating like the native vegetation and yards, residential yards, and like how how that could help too. Um, so uh, it's a really about reducing impervious surfaces. There's lots of opportunities and codes and ordinances and um, and then also reducing those barriers. Oh, and then another last thing, uh, one of the biggest opportunities is for integrating if you really want to move forward to green infrastructure uh, and incentivize it is put it in your purpose statements. You know, I like stay up front when developers come to your community, 
Like this is where, this is the direction we go. We care about water resources and stormwater management and we're going to be using green infrastructure. Okay, great. Yeah, so Julia, you started talking about who needs to be at the table, and I, I want to start transitioning into a, a discussion of that. So we're, we're kind of talking broadly up to this point, but uh, this next series of questions is really about how do we take these concepts and translate them into getting projects in the ground. Uh, and the first question is back to you again, Julia. Uh, what what stakeholders need to be at the table? So how, how do we codify these solutions, uh, and where are the levers of power? Uh, state level, watershed, county, municipal, developer, all the residents, all of the above, who needs to be at the table and, and where is the power in, in these discussions? This is a complicated question. I, I mean, obviously, we all have state uh, and federal, the you know, Clean Water Act, um, and many of the communities may have, you know, um, they might be in MS4 communities. So you're definitely going to be, but I mean, the EPA in general um, is going and many and many other federal level uh, agencies like FEMA, if we're talking about even flood mitigation, um, the Army Corps, they're all starting to talk about nature-based solutions and how to integrate them into their funding sources and opportunities to do that. So NOAA for, I mean, everyone's kind of moving in that direction slowly, um, at least at the federal level. Uh, for sure. So then it trickles down, you know, to the state. Um, and uh, a lot of that really just comes down to the stormwater management regulations. I do know in like Wisconsin and Southeast Wisconsin, a region, one watershed is, uh, or one MS4 kind of permit area, like the, of our DNR that works with, they're requiring in the general permit now that they must address barriers to codes and ordinances for green infrastructure. So they have to go through an audit and to meet even their general permit. Um, in areas where there's TMDLs, I don't know if you have those in Illinois, uh, you know, water quality um, uh, targets uh, and regulations. I don't know the, you know, the uh, green infrastructure is being used to help uh, communities and municipalities meet those water quality um, requirements too. Um, so, so that's that. And then uh, the, really the biggest opportunity is at this local level, because, you know, again, local codes and ordinances really infect everything. And I think it depends what state you're in, whether you have local control at the municipality or maybe you're in an unincorporated area and have a county level. Um, so thinking about because that's where land use development decisions are being made, you know, so that's like really are like where the point is. And so who should be at the table for green infrastructure in general and how our communities are redeveloped? I mean, the, the answer is everybody, especially the people in the communities that are being affected by it. Um, is that reality? Probably not so much right now, you know, so thinking about like policy, I mean, that is typically from what I've seen starting at like the staff level and, and the elected official level. So, and mainly staff just figuring out where those decisions are being made, whether it's in code or it's a policy, or maybe it's not in code, but you have, you know, the, the public works director is gung-ho and implements it trees wherever he can. And, and then, but what happens when he leaves? So, <laughs> you know, or moves to another municipality. So you wanna have those things codified. Um, and then I think when we get, you know, more, but we really do need, you know, these underinvested neighborhoods and the people in them like really have to be at the table in terms of thinking about how green infrastructure is implemented in their communities at, um, from from the beginning, from yeah. the beginning. Um, so yeah, so everybody everybody needs to be at the table. And I want to give a, an additional promotion for that code audit. I, I dropped the link in the chat, and I've I've looked through it. There's a lot of great information in there, a toolkit, uh, a step by step question and answer thing to help you to do this in your community so that's really great make sure to check it out and thanks julia and your team for putting it together uh next question is building on that so there's the ordinances and regulatory compliance but a question for dave where are the opportunities for collaboration so between the design community and planners and who else needs to be at the table and what are those opportunities boy i i'd say what, one of the things that I think is missing is, um, you know, there are, there are people who are planning projects, there are owners, there are designers, there are contractors who are building them, but once a project's built, getting the maintenance community on board 
um, because they end up touching these projects way longer than the architects and the engineers and the landscape architects do. So getting them on board with what can they be doing to help assure that these projects have their long-term uh, intent realized. Um, and that kind of gets back to the salt and you know how they're being ma maintained. So I think there's an opportunity. One of the other things I'm, I think is missing is once an ordinance is enacted, we don't always see, is it being evaluated? Is there this loop that is informing um, the ordinances? Do they need to be changed? You know, are, are they having their effect? It's, I think when people write an ordinance, they feel like they're done and time to move on to the next topic, but I don't see municipalities constantly evaluating their ordinances to see if they're being effective and if there are changes to be made making those changes it seems to be on to the next thing um the other thing is you know it's not only municipalities a lot of these issues aren't municipal but they're watershed issues and so breaking down those barriers between adjacent communities um, and getting things looked at on more of a watershed level if there are problems that's how you have to address them um, I'm trying to think of other people, you know, as, as far as landscape architects, getting the people who are growing the plant material in on it so that they're making the research to find what those new plants might be that, you know, that they stop growing the ones that we know are invasive and problematic. Um, you know, now's the perfect time of year. You can go out and see every calorie pear and every um, burning bush that shouldn't even be sold and there's still plants on the market. So bringing, bringing the producers, bringing the maintenance people, bringing people on more of a watershed level, um, I think are the opportunities to really up our, our game of, you know, across all of these sectors. Like Julia said, it's everybody's job. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've got a couple more questions, but I think we've, we've hit a lot of them. Uh, I want to transition to our closing feel good question before we go then to Q and A, and I'll, I'll go to Chad first. Uh, what do you see as the the greatest opportunity for more resilient designs going forward? Uh, good question. I want to first say echo what Dave just just finished saying, um, particularly from a green industry perspective. Um, we need to get on the same page. The, the nurseries, the designers, the um, uh, maintenance folks, good way to put it, who's maintaining these landscapes. Um, there's a lot of misalignment here. Um, there are practices over here that, that take away from things over here and, and, and that's a whole other discussion. But yes, we, we absolutely need to get on the same page within the green industry. Um, when it, <laughs> excuse me, when it comes to opportunities for resilience, um, and, and what is the role of us in the green industry, um, I, I'll keep it short, ambassadors and educators, um, I think we have an obligation to educate clients to, uh, to do whatever we can to push for, for sustainable practices across the board, um, and, uh, and, and educate and, and show people how uh, climate change and, and these other issues are, are impacting them directly. And I can walk on a property and I can say, this plant is dying because it has this disease and it's because we've had all this precipitation this year. And that is a result of climate change. So being a good ambassador and being a good educator, I think is uh, um, a good opportunity for all of us. Terrific. Uh, Dave, same question to you. What's, uh, what's the role of landscape architects and planners as the force for change? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, we just finished our first sites project. And so that was interesting um, for us, not only because it really takes this whole notion of landscape and green in infrastructure and takes the building equation out of it, since there's a lot of spaces that don't have buildings or buildings aren't changing. But what I really liked about it is it does get into the maintenance and it, it does talk about what, how, how do you maintain these spaces? And so even if they're well-designed, well-constructed, um, what are the chemicals that you use? What are the, the you know, how, how, do, how do you ensure that the goals of the project are, 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 are continuing to uh, happen? 
Um, what I'd like to see is is kind of a toolkit, you know, toolkits. So not not just one solution, but here are five ways that you can cope with this issue or that issue, because every site is different. Every community is different. Every project budget is different. People's resources are different. And if we had more of a diverse toolkit that we could use to affect um, stormwater and flooding that we could use to uh, affect uh, more sustainable landscapes or biodiversity loss or, you know, bringing food to communities that need it. If, if we had, you know, more options that people could use as designers and as owners, I think that would really make it more, um, just more resilient. Okay. I I, you were breaking up a little bit for me, but I think it's on my end. I, I just want to get a confirmation from somebody else. Did you hear yeah. all of what Dave said? I could hear everything he said. Okay, okay. it's on my end then. All right, I'm gonna fix my situation. And Julia, same question to you. How can we be the force for change? Uh, well, I, I really do think, I mean, the greatest opportunity, at least in terms of thinking about resilient landscapes and green infrastructure is the fact that they meet so many multiple benefits of that a community could use or need for the future. It's not just one you know, underground system that costs a lot of money uh, that no one sees ever again. You know, it can it can really, really help meet different goals in one system, whether and we just have to learn. We have to really figure out how to quantify those and, and bring those values into our decision making processes. Um, and then, you know, I am going to answer the you know, what is the role of the landscape architect and planner? Because I'm not either of those things. Uh, I, I think based though on, you know, Jim's presentation, it's pretty clear that we're at an all hands on deck kind of situation and uh, thinking like, what in your role can you do? I mean, I think all of us should be figuring out where we affect change and we all make decisions. We all have these, we have some positions of power of over something, whether it's our own yards or somebody else's. And um, I would love, I don't know anything about landscape architecture. So you are, I think you should, I think this audience really needs to understand that they have the expertise, even if they don't think they it's totally correct. You know, you have some, and just to start talking about it with your clients and with your, if you're, you know, with your municipalities, if you're in general about what we should be doing. Um, and I think you would probably get a pretty positive response just in general, because there, most of us are not experts in these fields and we're, we're you know, it's bringing those multiple perspectives together. Okay. Uh, there was one more quick point I wanted to make that I forgot Please. is, you know, I think one way to get more people on the bandwagon and I'm thinking about property owners and developers is how can we incentivize all of these things that we need to do because they look at it as a financial e equation. And if we can find ways to help their bottom line, they would be way more involved and invested in some of these things. Um, and that might be just one more, one, one more toolkit piece. Okay. All right. This is terrific. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. There's a lot of questions that have come in through the chat. And I'm going to try to get through as many of them as I can. I'm going to go a little bit out of order here because this first one builds on what you just said, Dave. So this first one, how do we incorporate stormwater infrastructure uh, as it can raise costs quickly and keep projects accessible for low to middle income households or, or developments with affordable housing? Yeah, and boy, I mean, that could that be through grants? Could it be through tax incentives? Could it be through um, partnerships? Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of the reason a lot of these things don't happen is there are financial ramifications, and you know, I most of my work is on higher education campuses, and if they have a budget for a building, they want to put as much economic resource towards the educational mission of of the campus and of the department who's building the building. So saying, oh, we need to spend more money so we can put in permeable parking and rain gardens and harvest rainwater for irrigation is tough. But if there was a way that they could tap into resources, you know, again, more people would be on board. Julia. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I just think, I mean, regular gray infrastructure costs money too. Um, yep. <laughs> in general, and, and this can be very quite expensive. And again, we have these multiple benefits and thinking about it, I think the money thing, I, 
I think Dave brought up a lot of great actually avenues that uh, if you actually have a team that's bringing more perspectives to them, that mm. that there could be creative solutions. And that's yep. kind of where we're at. Like, uh, you know, I've seen them integrated into requirements, integrated into TIF districts before. Um, and, and then also, you know, thinking also about, you know, development, if you have less impervious surface, you have more area to build homes, actually, potentially, rather than taking up a large space with uh, like a stormwater pond or something like that, too. Uh, so and then there's also in codes and ordinances, there could be trade offs. So maybe people get more height than, you know, le for less parking. So I, I think like there's many different ways to go about it. There's a lot of grant opportunities, especially in the Great Lakes uh, to to help bring in those like to help pay for maybe the extra design costs, you know, at least, or, or bring that expertise in too. And then also um, in terms of maintenance, which is always gonna be, it's just a huge issue, uh, is thinking about how can you design it then to meet the, to fit into the current maintenance protocols as is, and, or, you know, that's not extraneous. So, and doing developments like a large neighborhood development um, and having it like private, green infrastructure can be problematic because that's just a recipe for not being maintained over time. Uh, so thinking about though, how can you design, you know, even bioswales that are simple and can get just mowed, like all the rest of the swales or ditches, you know, it can still have a lot of stormwater benefits, so. Yeah, Julia, you brought up a great point where we've had the most success is when we can bring other costs down. So we've been able to talk projects and harvesting rainwater for irrigation because there was an eight to 10 year payback because they were buying municipal water to irrigate their, their campus. Where we've been able to get permeable pavements and um, rain gardens is when the civil was able to put in less inlets and pipes. So you're absolutely right. If we're working together as a design team, some of these things not only have better benefits for all the other things, but they lower some other costs. And that's, that's the perfect way to start to pay for these things. Okay, all right, this is going great. Uh, I wanna pull Jim back in for this next question. And it's related to something Chad said earlier about do we just look a couple of hardiness zones to the south and factor that into the designs? Um, so, but somebody asked about the polar vortex. And I saw that you started to answer this in the chat, but what is the impact of icy polar air coming down for the, the climate of Northeast Illinois? Yeah, you know, that's a, <clears throat> a good point because uh, while we talk about overall trends, temperatures getting warmer and milder winters, we still always have that risk of the nasty old polar vortex showing up and dumping cold air on Illinois. And uh, so, and we saw that a couple of years ago. In fact, we just set our new record low for Illinois was in 2019, January 2019 at Mount Carroll yep. at minus 36. So, uh, so that's problematic when you're trying to uh, plant uh, trees and, and perennials that, uh, that are sensitive to cold like that. Uh, there, so the polar vortex in short is it, in, the, in the winter time, in our winter time, uh, the cold, really cold air over the North Pole, it pretty much stays right there. It's got a, its own unique circulation pattern. Basically, it just kind of swirls around in its own little um, uh, container there. And, and, and when the polar, and that's the actual polar vortex, so it's actually rotating around. When that kind of falls apart, it allows that cold air to spill out and, and reach down into Illinois. Uh, or the luck of the draw, it might be Europe or it might be China. Uh, it just depends on, on where, how it breaks down. There was some thought a couple of years ago that with the uh, change in, uh, in uh, as we warm up the atmosphere in general, that it could cause that to destabilize more often and, and dump more cold air into our region. The jury's still out on that one. It's um, it, it kind of competing factors. One is it may be more unstable, but also we're warming the Arctic so much that uh, that cold air may not be as intense as it used to be. So uh, those that may be a factor as well. Uh, there's also some thought that maybe that isn't the destabilization may not be as pronounced as originally thought. So it's still kind of it's an area of research that's it's fascinating, uh, and uh, there, but the jury's still kind of out on on what the overall effects would be. And I think I mentioned in the comments there that there's a guy named Judah Cohen who's uh, 
uh, MIT, but he also does his own uh, research that's kind of, uh, it seems like he's on the forefront of, of understanding the polar vortex and when it breaks down. He actually does winter forecasts based off of that. Okay. The, the luck of the draw, whether we get the, the <laughs> polar right. vortex. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. All right. Terrific. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. The next one I want to pose to Chad. You were talking about the difference between urban forests versus just reforestation. And this question is related to uh, private landowners or, or private landowners in public areas. How, how can they start exploring the needs and opportunities for green infrastructure or, or urban trees or et cetera? Oof, I might have to, um, being a humble, uh, humble biologist, I might need to do my best matrix uh, move and, and dodge that to, to Dave or someone else. Um, I guess what I, what I can say about um, what we know about um, sequestering carbon in trees, kind of what I, what I had said earlier, uh, it's really forests and specifically it's mature trees. Um, the smaller diameter, younger trees, they, they add a little bit to it, but maintaining old growth, mature trees um, is, is where carbon is sequestered. And uh, uh, yeah, as far as, far as the, the, the aspect about more information on that or getting started, I, I, I might have to point them to somebody else for that. Julia, Sorry. did you did you come across that in your code audit of ordinances that that promote the conservation of a private land or, or large open spaces? I don't think I don't think so. I think it uh, the code audit's really about you know is more in the ur very urban areas. Um, yeah. Well, and I'm sorry, I was reading someone else's question. What was the first, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, for private landowners uh, interested in green infrastructure or other mm -hmm. resilient designs, where, where can they get started? Huh. Uh, uh, that's really, <laughs> that's, so I have like seven rain barrels at my house. So start with a rain barrel if you don't already have one. They're kind of addicting, <laughs> especially in those drought times <laughs> in August, about August time, you're going to want one more always. Um, and then I, I mean, just that it, I don't, I, I know if you're talking about, I think it, you have to think about, I just started small. I have, you know, I just dug a hole and dug my own rain garden, like where I knew there was a drainage issue. Like we had a little flooding issue and uh, so I, I, we made a rain garden. I've also started just to try to replace turf grass with, with native prairie plants or, and they can look, I have one area that's like a nice garden versus one that's just like, like seeded kind of, and kind of look a little bit more scattered. Um, so I, I think that's, I, for me personally, finding someone to do permeable materials is a lot more difficult. Maybe it's just my region, but uh, there's not a lot of landscapers that even offer those products and it requires specialized equipment and it's quite expensive. So, uh, but put, thinking about that, putting it in your own. So, and then, you know, if you have a forest, it depends on your state, but like Wisconsin has, you know, state forestry type easements. You can do a conservation easement with a local uh, land trust, things like that. I don't know if that helps at all. But. Yeah, I, I think you can use um, you know, some of the resources are just each state has co cooperative ex extension agents in, in counties that can get you very specific in, information or lead you to research that's being done at U of I or UW or where, wherever. A lot of municipalities or regions um, like the like Chicago has the Green Alley Handbook um, that talks about not only ways to improve um, environments in your in, in your alleys, but because most homes abut one, it kind of shows you what you can do from your roof on on down. Um, other communities, um, we we've done um, landscaping guides for like the uh, Duna e ecology. If if you have some of these more nate native things, but you know, I, I think that the extension offices are a great place to start in terms of pointing people in the right direction. Okay, 
All right. I think that's all the time that we've got. There are more questions in the chat that we didn't get to, so I apologize to those folks. But there's also a lot of great answers in the chats because we've got a lot of smart people on this webinar. I want to say thanks to our panelists. I uh, really appreciate your time today, and I'm going to kick it back to my colleague, Amanda. Amanda. Thank you, Justin, and thank you again to all of our panelists. This was a fascinating discussion. Um, I just want to keep listening. I wanted to keep going. I was like, no, our time is up. Um, so thank you all for your expertise and your time and really getting us all thinking. Also, thank you to everyone in the chat to really give these great examples and links. Um, I'm sure Justin and I will work together here to kind of share all that with you after the fact with the recording as well. So you can have access to that information as well as, as uh, Jim's great presentation. So we really appreciate you joining us today on this beautiful fall afternoon. Um, just a reminder, if you're looking for continuing education credits from both the APA side or the ASLA side, um, you'll receive a link from APA. And if you need it from the ASLA side, please email myself at the education email um, so we can go forward with that. But we look forward to you joining us again. We're hoping that in 2022, we collaborate again with each other and have some of these great events. We know we will, and hopefully we'll be in person at that time. So we really appreciate everyone joining us today and have a beautiful afternoon.